Okay, hello there. I am joined today by Boff Wally, and I'm extremely delighted to be joined by you, Boff. So, hello and thank you. Hi, hi, Gerald. You're right. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Yes. So, okay. Um, I'm going to steam straight into this. For people who don't know who you are, um, I suspect you would probably want everything to get equal billing here, but I'd imagine most people would know you, uh, or know of you for being in in Chumba Wamba. Um, first question, actually, do people ever say Chumba Wamba as opposed to Chumba Wumba? I was I was going to jump in and say that was brilliantly pre pronounced, fantastic. It's the only song I've ever said. It. <laughs> yeah. No, everybody <laughs> says Chumba Wumba, and even and they even spell it Chumba Wumba, and it's 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 really funny, even when they're like looking at the word. <laughs> yeah. So well yeah. done, nice one. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. Um, normal service will probably be resumed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Over. There's something about the word, isn't it? That the second bit lends yeah. itself to rhyming, I suppose. It does, yeah. absolutely, it does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but also, you haven't just done that. You've written books. You've written your memoirs, book about fell running. You have. Uh, got the commoners choir and the, you may well be up to things that I've got no idea about as well so so we will cover that but first I want to do it in a kind of chronological order so yeah. I'm interested in say people individuals and so on really and and the story the story behind the story so can we start off could you tell us a bit about your upbringing and perhaps with a bent on how it may have kind of influenced how you are now as an adult um okay um I was brought up um I had the first few years of my life were um where uh, were in a single parent family with my mum. She kicked my dad out because he was a violent alcoholic. Um then she joined the Mormon church and took me and my sister into it too. So I grew up in a in a strict religious Mormon upbringing until I was about 15 and I got into music in a big big way when I was about 14 and it was stuff like the Bonzo Dog Band and Frank Zappa and I, I kind of realized that and I've been into Monty Python and I just wanted I just wanted to get away from that the kind of shackles of of that kind of hideously straight restrictive life even though my family are great you know they're brilliant but I just I couldn't do it and then and then I saw and and it's you know, I tell this story at least once every few months, but uh, Johnny Rotten came on TV and on Granada TV on the first Pistols um, TV appearance on So It Goes with with Tony Wilson and sang Anarchy in the UK. And the first thing he he sang, he looked straight at the camera and shouted, get off your ass!" And I'd never seen anything like it. I wasn't, you know, I knew about punk. I'd heard about it and I'd heard about this band. But I had nothing that prepared me for that, for what it was, because I didn't understand it. And when they played, they played Anarchy in the UK, and I couldn't, I couldn't fathom the music out. I was like, "What? What's going on here? It's just a, a mess." Now, of course, it seems really, really, you know, straight. But um, you know, it's like the first time I heard Public Enemy, I, th I thought the same thing. I just couldn't work it out. I was like, "What's going on there?" So, and then, you know, within a couple of days of hearing something, it becomes clear. And the next day at school. Um, everybody was well. All my mates were all talking about it because we all watched the music. Uh, so it goes for the music, and instead of it being like sad cafe and you know just mediocre northwest rock bands, the Pistols had been on, and it just became this phenomenon. And everyone was really excited and wondering what to do and what do you do? Can you? Is it possible to see them? And so yeah, so that changed my life basically. And I've been like a kind of stuck record with that for for um, you know for, <laughs> for thirty years, or whatever. No, forty years. Sorry, forty years. And um, that kind of um, that's up a, a really interesting template for me, which was which was just about um, obviously that that got me away from the church, from the Mormon church. I, I you know I never went back, and that was the way out, going to gigs and starting bands and doing fanzines and I was part of setting up a music collective in Burnley in North East Lancs and that whole DIY spirit kind of gave me the the push to do everything else I've ever done since and so I've ended up now I'm obviously I was in Chumbawamba for millions of years and that that informed what we did right the way through even and then and now I'm working with like theatre groups, uh, with Welsh National Opera, with 
uh, community groups, writing and all sorts. And and I can honestly say it's all informed by that challenge that I saw on TV, which was do something. I don't don't care what it is, but do something about the world, talk about the world, try and get your voice out there. You, you and that's it in a nutshell. You had a band Chim Peaks Banana before that, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so we so we not long after that pistols thing, probably about a year, within a year, me and my friend Sage, who was this just great bloke, he was a guitarist in a band called Not Sensibles, and they were kind of the local heroes because they'd started a band and they'd done two or three gigs like as punks. They used to do covers of uh, One Called Wonders, and um, you know they did a Small Faces song, you know, obviously because the Pistols were doing Small Faces songs, so it's like, oh, we better do one. And uh, and they were great. They were just really good fun and they were loud and snotty. And, you know, we'd go and see them at gigs in working men's clubs where the the people who booked them didn't realise what they were going to get. And all these like <laughs> these yeah. young punks would turn up and they'd, and they'd literally get halfway through the first set and say, right, well, you know, we're paying you off, lads. You know, that's enough, thanks. <laughs> and so, we, we, so we, we had this thing for, for a while, six months of that, this kind of heady thing where loads of stuff started happening. And me and Sage had heard about the Manchester Musicians Collective. Um, and we knew that I'd seen the fall on, uh, again, on Granada before they had the first single out, before Bingo Master's breakout. And uh, I remember thinking they, they're they the kind of band I want to be, even because you know, I did no singles out or anything. And uh, we heard that they were in the Manchester Musicians Collective. So we went to a meeting, which was downstairs in a bookshop on Tib Street. And it was Dick Witts who was in the passage was the the kind of host. He was kind of organising it, I think, and a couple of other Manchester people. And they were just beautiful, friendly, open, um, you know, inspiring people. And there was there was a couple of Joy Division there and Rob Gretton and uh, Mick Hucknall, that Simply Red, was there. It was and a couple of, um, what's she called, Kay Carroll from The Fall. And they were just like ordinary people and these are ordinary already started to become our heroes and it just made us we got we 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 left that meeting me and sage and we got on the bus back to burnley and we said we're gonna we're gonna do it we've got to start a collective in burnley that thing you just said there ordinary people but also your heroes that's an interesting kind of dynamic really isn't it because yeah. heroes were always kind of out of reach and otherworldly and living in america and all these kind of things that meant you were never going to meet them so it must have been quite a sort of weird emotion for you to sort of have have heroes that were also kind of people you could just talk to on an equal level yeah absolutely yeah it was you know you you don't really get a chance to be starstruck when you're just in a meeting with some people and they're just they're just discussing how much um you know whether, whether how much it costs to hire a PA to to put a gig on for the collective bands. It was just like, okay, this is how it works, you know. And in and Manchester was the closest kind of pop, you know, music city. And as it happens, it was just full of of stuff going on. So we ended up we'd just go there like once or twice a week just to go to the record shops and hang out and go to gigs and go to the the old Virgin record store before it was you know all done over. It was just some tatty old shop. I remember going in there on a on a Saturday afternoon and seeing my first Residence album. Again, I'd heard about him and the Enemy and everybody, you know. But I've never, I'd never heard, heard anything by him. I mean, John Peel used to play him a little bit later, but I just remember seeing that first Residence album with the Beatles' um, faces drawn on, and I just thought, this is great. I want to be part of this world, and so, and I couldn't play any instruments. And I knew I could kind of write, and I knew I was musical, but I'd I'd never played an instrument and everything. And uh, we we went to this collective meeting in Burnley, the very first one, and we got there was this bloke called Simon Lanzan who kind of pulled in people from everywhere. He was part of the local arts organisation, and we had this meeting. There were about thirty people there, and, and Simon said, "Right, we're going to pass a piece of paper around, and everyone that's here that's in bands, we're going to try and get gigs for. So if you just put the name of your band on this piece of paper." So it came around to me and and Danbert and Midge, and we obviously we weren't in a band. We'd never we'd never discussed being in a band, but it got to us and we we just wrote on a piece. We wrote on the piece of paper. We wrote you know Chimpy's Banana and we put our telephone number just as a joke. And then literally about two two or three weeks later, Simon rang up, or Spider rang up and said, 
yeah, we've got you a gig. Um, and we we literally, none of us had ever played instruments, even though Sage was a guitarist in Not Sensibles. And I always really looked up to him, but I, I, you know, I never had a guitar or anything. So we went to Danbert's house and we all sat around. There must have been about six of us. And we said, what are we going to do? And we were like, right, well, we've got to do it. We're going to do the gig. And it, it was literally like this. It was like, who, who's, who wants to play what? Do you want to, have you played a bass before? No. Well, it's got to be easier than a guitar because there's only four strings. So you you could do the bass, couldn't you? You know, Danbert became the vocalist just because nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> it like, well... the, and, opposite, uh, the opposite thing to a lot of bands, I suspect. Yeah. And it was great. It was just that spirit of turning up to your first gig and not knowing. I borrowed an electric guitar and learned, you know, a few chords. And I played mainly on one string. But um, that thing of not knowing where to plug in, asking someone, what, what do I do with this this long curly lead? Where does it, where do you put it? And they're like, yeah, you just stick it in here and you put it in. You think, wow, this is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The and, you know, works. as a youth culture, as a, as a kind of movement, I don't think anything out, maybe Skiffle, you know, obviously a long before I was around did that. But in general, nothing ever did that before. You always had to have some level of expertise before you, you went got and stood on a stage. Mm. So and was, you had to have the instruments and so on as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And you had to kind of had this kind of inside knowledge of how it worked and what, what are you supposed to do and all that sort of thing. So what were you like at this gig? Was it good? I mean, enjoyable, I presume, but was it? What, if there was a tape of it? It was enjoyable because what we did is we said, right, we, and what we'll do is every gig we'll do it, we'll have, we used to call them concepts, we'll have a different concept and we'll all, we'll do different songs and have a different idea, theme for every gig. So the first gig, I can't remember why we decided this, we decided the first gig was going to be about going to sleep, it was called a bed gig. So we all went, we all played in pajamas. We actually went to the gig in pajamas, walking down the street with like a guitar and in pajamas. And uh, we sung songs about, about dreams and going to sleep. And all the time, Gilly who was in the band, but couldn't play anything and couldn't sing. He, we took a roll up mattress and he slept on the stage in the middle all the way through. And so people liked it because we were just trying something weird and different. And then the next gig, we were, I can't remember. We were like, oh, let's do something. So every gig we tried to think, let's do something different. Excellent. I think um, what you were saying about the, the musicians' collectives and so on, I think you handled um, success. Oh, excuse me. Alarm on my phone. When will I learn? <laughs> right. I think you handled success, fame, whatever you would call it, so much better than a lot of people. And I wonder if the whole kind of musicians' collective thing gave you the sort of footing to sort of keep your feet on the ground to some extent. When you know a lot of people, of course, have failed to do that. Yeah, I mean, punk definitely, definitely did. It it was, it was, one of the things about about I've talked to um, there's a writer called Mark Hodkinson, and he's he writes lots of stuff about music and stuff, and we've talked about this. One of the big things that people kind of forget about punk, even before the anarcho punk stuff, was that there was a level of social responsibility that you didn't get in other things. And, that, and it taught me about, about the world. You know, I, w I was, I mean, because of my Mormon upbringing, I was basically a homophobic racist when punk came along. You know, I kind of, I was snotty about Tom Robinson releasing Glad to be Gay. I was, you know, I was horrible. And I, and I learned really quickly, mm. you know, through like Rock Against Racism and things like that. But, uh, but it was that thing of thinking, um, this is really important stuff and it, and it's about people and it's that's the important thing. So obviously when, by the time we were releasing a record, which was like 15 years later that, you know, that we're getting in the charts and stuff, we, you know, we'd learned to keep our feet on the ground and not take it too seriously because it didn't mean anything. You know, selling a lot of records has never meant anything really. Some of my favourite records hardly sold at all. You say it doesn't mean anything, but I, I defy you to deny that if you hear it at a football match or something, that you must get a little uh, a little bit of pride or something. There must, must be a good yeah. thing. Yeah, I do. I do. But that pride that pride is uh, it's genuinely in the fact that... Um, so the first time I heard it on a football match, I was having a pee in the toilets at Turf Moor and it came over the tannoy. I was there like like pissing with, you know, like 30 other blokes in there. 
and I couldn't say anything. I couldn't go, yes, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> yeah, but I was really excited. And then what I was excited about was that nobody knew it was me, and and still nobody knows. It's I'm not connected to that. It's 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 a song that people like and people jump up and down to, and I'm really proud of of that. It's it's almost like a folk song, you know, a, a national no, not a national international folk song. Yeah, it doesn't really belong to. It, it connects with people on a very kind of visceral level, doesn't it? And it's nothing to do with punk rock in that respect. It really does connect yeah. to people who've, who couldn't give a shit about punk rock. Yeah, um, and that's yeah. that's an astonishing achievement. And I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here, but I would, yeah. it does make me think another thing. I, I saw an interview where you said you wrote it about some neighbour of yours going yeah. to the loser and so on. Does he know it's about him? No, no. I, I, we went back I don't know, three or four years later and knocked on the door and see if, to see if he was in. And he, he did gone, they left. There were some student nurses or something in there. And uh, he probably wouldn't have ever clocked it. I don't know. But I always used to say, look, it's about this pub called the Ford Green, which is around the corner from where we live. And and it's about actually hearing this guy singing Danny Boy as he stumbled around trying to get his key in the door and and all that sort of stuff. Because I just that album, we decided to write songs about the places around us rather than kind of international or global political things or about, you know, Tories in London. We decided to write about things that were around us like northern kind of the stuff people have to deal with on a very ordinary level. And that was just one of the songs. Yeah, like the Kinks or something like that. Or something. Yeah, yeah. And it's nice to do that because you can still talk about the world while you're talking about a pub at the end of the road. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because you're just talking about people, aren't you, at the end of the yeah. Um, You went to college in Kent, didn't you? Yeah. Where does months. that fit in with all this? <laughs> I uh, so, so after I got out of the church... Um, there is another little strand in here, which is I all I wanted to be when I was growing up was a footballer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just wanted to. I've got I've got a drawing. Is it still there? Yeah, I've got a drawing behind me, which I did when I was about six, and it says it's just a picture of me with a Burnley kit on, and it says, uh, "When I grow up, when I grow up, I shall be a footballer." It doesn't say I want to be, <laughs> and I love that. I mean, when my mum found it, like few years ago I was like oh that's brilliant yeah so I really wanted and until the age of 11 I was obsessed with being a footballer and then I had a trial for the youth team Burnley youth town team and uh and I didn't get picked and that was a big blow we were yeah. going to secondary school I just started listening to music and then it was it was almost like a thing of thinking right well what what am I going to do and I decided I, I loved um Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein and pop art and all that sort of thing and I thought that's what I want to do. I want to be an artist. When you were eleven, yeah. When well, when I was twelve, when I first went to secondary school, I just thought I want to do art. Right. And um, and I enjoyed doing art at school, so I thought, yeah, this is great. I really enjoy this. This is lovely because I didn't really enjoy school at all. So um, yeah. So then, so then, and when I, and I left school a year early. I took my A levels a year early, um, because this school was obsessed with trying to get people who they thought were bright into uh oxbridge into oxford and cambridge so they, they 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 made you sit the exams a year early and rush through all the years kind of thing so that you had a year to prepare for your oxbridge exam but of course when it got to that bit i just i decided i wanted to go to art college and i didn't I, no way did i want to you know go to oxford or cambridge obviously so uh and punk had started we just started chimp it's banana and i the only art college i could get into at late notice was at Maidstone Art College doing graphic design and uh, it was a disaster. I went to Maidstone purely because I thought it was really close to London. I tried to get in about three or four of the London art schools and couldn't get in. I thought, oh, Maidstone, that's really close. I looked on a map. Yeah, that'll be fine. <laughs> but of course, the last train was, I can't remember, but I was really disappointed. <laughs> um, so I'd just go into London every weekend try and see whatever gigs I could see and then go back to Maidstone and and I just thought I'd, I can't stand this and back back home in Burnley that band that we just just about started they were all you know carrying on and I thought I can't miss that I'm gonna have to go back so I gave up at Christmas and went back. Is that the only time you've ever lived down south? Oops let me just decline that. Um, no I lived in London for a year 
Okay. Uh, about 90, mid, mid 90s, I think, which was all right. But my, my partner, Casey, she was, she was ill for a lot of the time. So I ended up, I was thinking about this the other day, actually, because I was walking through, anyway, for some reason, I was remembering the fact that when Casey was ill, it, it meant that I, I'd go out in London, kind of on my own. I didn't really know people, not, not many people. I learned that thing, which is that in London, everyone stays in their own area. <laughs> Again, I, you know, stupid Northern Ike, I assume that if there's a gig on, everybody goes to it if you live in London. But um, I remember going to see uh, Elliot Smith at some college, and it was snowing. It was in December, and it was snowing, and he came back on and did an encore. Do you know Elliot Smith? No. He's he's a kind of acoustic punky. He did the music on Goodwill Hunting, and, yeah, anyway, absolutely beautiful. And he did a cover of a George Harrison song, a Christmas song. Give me hope, give me peace on earth, give me light. And it was so, and I came out of the, the, the gig and it was snowing. And I was walking back towards up to Highgate where we lived. And uh, and it was just, it was like the saddest feeling in the world. <laughs> I thought, again, I thought, you know, all the rest of the chumbers were all up in Leeds, all having a good time. And by then I was like, come on, we need to go back north for a while. Mm. Okay, so Chumbawamba, yeah. Um, you go home back to the sort of Chimpeach Banana Land, then you relocate to Leeds. Mm. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And then Chumbawamba, I'm definitely going to get the Wamba bit in. Yeah, yeah. I you might even well. exaggerate it. Doing well. Um, so, how how does that band start? We two summers running, we went busking in Paris, three or four of us, and. Uh, I had this Spanish guitar that had, uh, it was one of those that probably cost about, you know, 14 quid and the strings on it, it had been around, it had been around for so long that the neck was like bowed. So the strings were like literally about half an inch from the fretboard. Yeah. But it was all I had. And, and, uh, and uh, Midge had a drum, a snare drum and some sticks. And we went busking in Paris. We did about two or three months, both times. The first time we did, uh, we were doing like clash songs and undertones and things like that. Anything that's kind of poppy end of punk we were doing. And it, and it taught us, we just thought, that's what we want to do. We want to be a band properly. And we came back from the second of those tours saying, right, when we get back, this is what we're going to do. And as it happens, when we got back was when we kind of stumbled into having, finding this big squatted house. Well, this big empty house by then. And we decided to squat it and invited people along, friends to come and live in it because it was huge. At one point, there was like nine or 10 of us there and it had a basement, which we decided would be, you know, for rehearsing. And we just practiced like probably every other day for, for years. The first time I became aware of you, if my memory serves correctly, you did a sort of compilation tape called the Animals Tape or Package. We did. Like yeah, we did, yeah. Yeah. Because we were on one of the bullshit detectors, bullshit detector two, and and we were so I was so enamored by it, because I used to follow Crass around for a while then. I used to go and see him in all these places, but but kind of kept we kept our distance from it as well. Um we weren't uncritical in our love of crass. But when they did Bullshit Detector, we had no idea they were putting it out. We just sent them a, a cassette that we'd done in our basement. And uh, and they said, yeah, great, we're going to put some of it on the next Bullshit Detector album. And we were like, whoa, I didn't even know there was going to be an album. But we were so so fired up by this idea that they, they were helping all these different bands uh, that we thought, right, well, we should do that. So we wrote to all the bands on the Bullshit Detector album because there were all the addresses on there as well. And we said, look, we shouldn't just leave it here. We should we should all do some more stuff together and not just rely on crass to put stuff out. So we're going to, we'll do a compilation, you know, we'll do two or three compilation tapes and send us your stuff and we'll... And about, probably about a third of them got back in touch. Most of them just either said, oh, we're not interested or didn't get back in touch. But one of the bands that got in touch was uh, Passion Killers from Barnsley. And we used to love their track anyway. And they just turned up at the house and they were like, we got your letter and we think it's great. And, you know, and they came in and we were chatting with them. They're really young, 14. And and at the end of this lovely day we, we spent with them, they were like, oh, do you know, is there any uh, 
are there any bus shelters around here that we can sleep in? <laughs> that was as opposed to saying, is, is it possible to stay at your house? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. they kind of stayed overnight and never left, basically, and, and then became part of Chumbawamba. So at this point, you're kind of entering the anarcho punk world, really. Um, you were always kind of, yeah. you always stood out, as in your your live act and your music was much more considered, much more thoughtful and much more original than the average anarcho band. And there were an awful lot of average anarcho bands within that, I would <laughs> say. Um, yeah. So what I'm wondering there is how much a part of it you felt. So did you actually just feel completely a part of it, but you wanted to do something different? Or did that difference kind of put a bit of a kind of a gap between you and, and those bands? There was definitely a gap, definitely. Even the bands we really got on with, we knew there was a, a gap there. And um, one thing that, that we thought was strange was that so many of the bands were were inspired by and kind of following what Crass had done, rather than uh, we were never... And we were inspired by Crass as well, but but our our roots were the Beatles and the Pistols and the Clash, and that kind of musicality and that that thing of, well, let's use harmonies, let's try, you know, can we can we muster a three part harmony and 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 so we saw Crass and thought, well, they're absolutely fantastic, but we're never going to sound like Crass. We can't do that. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, we did feel different, and I think being from the north made us feel we weren't really a part of it as well you know we never played with crass or whatever you know it's it was um but the politics i loved i was really into the politics i remember writing to uh crass a couple of times with kind of you know critical but but we're on your side kind of letters and I remember getting a really snotty letter back from pete wright once <laughs> Because it, what it what it was is that they'd done they'd just brought out uh, Nagasaki Nightmare, which I think is a you know a beautiful single. One of the best things about it for me was that because uh, it was the same time they were playing with Annie Anxiety, and I thought Annie Anxiety was brilliant. I loved how a lot of the crass audience didn't like her. I thought, um, so the beginning of Nagasaki Nightmare has about about two minutes of this beautiful kind of gongs and bells and and that kind of soundscape. And I went to see him playing live, and they did that soundscape like 15 seconds, and then bang, straight into the song. I was really disappointed because I thought, look, this is the bit where you get to challenge the audience and and kind of, you know, make them think about in a different way about the music. And so I wrote to him about it. So, I, you know, I love what you you lot do, but um, I was disappointed with that because I, I think it'd be brilliant if you did challenge the audience a bit. Pete Wright was like, how dare you? You know, make assumptions of our audience and assume that they're not they're not thinking about you know all this sort of thing. And so we were doing a fancy. I remember, yeah. <laughs> so we were like, oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was it was that thing. It was like a lot of people were aping crass, whereas we wanted we loved crass and all that, but we were aping, you know, stuff from earlier. And and when Penny came out and said a lot of stuff about the pistols and really slagging him off, I just thought, nah. No, the pistols were a kind of what, especially if you're in a little northern town and, you know, you're not kind of clued into the music scene or the political scene. That sort of stuff is is really important. Yeah. Not yeah. everyone's going to come out as a, you know, fully fledged anarchist and all that. But, yeah, it was quite conservative, wasn't it, the anarcho-punk thing? I was, I was going to come on straight on to that. Yes, the conservatism mm. within it. I mean, the... It is just a fact of, of life and record sales that um, with you as outliers, that the more cliched bands were, the more records they sold, the more popular they were. And, yeah. and perhaps still are, for all I know, yeah. within that scene. Yeah. So I was wondering kind of how you sort of feel, stroke, felt about it. Um because you did play a lot of gigs with those kind of bands, didn't you? Mm. I think you were kind of yeah. you were part of it on a sort of uh whatever the word is you know yeah you were a part of it in the sense you were on those bills and you played with those bands yeah. etc maybe not crass but certainly a lot yeah. of the kind of what you might call the second wave of it or yeah like those kind of bands and so on was there any edge there or were, or were you or were you just kind of putting solidarity before your differences 
yeah, I think we were put in solidarity before differences. And I, I kind of remember thinking that that even the stuff that I kind of thought, oh, well, you know, this is like, you know, one, two, three, four, punk. And it, it's all right. It's got its place. That's fine. But it's just not not really my kind of thing. It's not what, what I want us to do. But there were there were quite a lot of, we gravitated towards bands who, so I'd say that, that um, um, from the little I remember, for instance, of, of Flowers in the Dustbin, I'd say I, anyone that I think sounded like they'd, they'd listened to music before Crass, I was interested in. BC, you might say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, BC, exactly. And so there were bands, um, you know, some of the, you know, Kill Your Pet Puppy bands. And it was obviously there was a kind of Ants influence and all that sort of thing, which I loved because I just thought, Good. Something else is. They're trying to do something else. Bands like I mean, I, actually, this weekend I've just been down to Shrewsbury and I met up with um, totally by coincidence. I met up with Bev, who was the guitarist in a band called No Defenses. I don't even remember them. I do remember them. Yes. Yeah. They were they were amazing. We did a tour with them. They were so confrontational. They had a woman singer, and the music was this kind of swirling, weird. You know, lacked rhythm, and then it came together, and she would scream these words but it was it was all poetry so it was she would say things like um we are living in the worst imaginable time right now <laughs> and we were like whoa this is fantastic but um anyone like that anyone that was just trying to do something different it was great in that world because there were so many of the you know and it's, it's I don't want to kind of name loads of bands because because I think what they were doing was probably really good. But you know, for me, a lot of the Bristol bands. Wait till we finish recording. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just thought, well, some of them they're really nice people, but I I've I just don't get it. I just mm. I just think, what, what is this? What's it doing? So we're talking about the conservatism of the crowd there. How, did your crowd was that your crowd as well, or or how quickly did you have a sort of Mutated crowd. Yeah, we did. We got a mutated crowd quite quickly because we, by the time we put our first album out, we had all these songs which were all lined up for us to do our first album, which was '85, I think, something like that. And um, and Live Aid was announced. We already had the studio booked. We were going to pay for it all ourselves. We didn't, we you know, we had, we didn't have a record label or anything. Just, and uh, we booked this studio, and we had done these songs for about a year and a half got them to a point where we thought they were like really, you know, properly ready to be recorded. And then Live Aid was announced. And before we went to the studio, we had a big meeting where we said, let's not do any of the songs that, that we've been doing for two years. Let's do a completely new set of songs and make it all about Live Aid. And it was like, oh my goodness, you know, we're just going to completely shoot ourselves in the foot here. But we did it and it worked because people picked up on it really quickly and thought, yeah, they're trying to say something in a different way. And so that was a kind of template. So we did one more a kind of punky album, which was Never Mind the Ballots. And then we had another meeting where we said, right, we've done enough of that. Let's do an a cappella album with no instruments that's all traditional English rebel songs. And, you know, obviously we were discussing the fact that we're just going to lose all our audience. Nobody will be interested. They'll all walk out. But it was the opposite suddenly we were able to go to places like Germany and Holland and people loved it. They were like, they were really interested in this other side of that shouty, you know, jumpy shouty thing. And Is so it better that... in Europe? You are? Was it better in Europe in that respect? Well, I people mean, were more, doing... people were more, more uh, welcoming of different ideas. Definitely. Yeah. And people started coming because we were Chumbawamba. And if we'd say, right, we're going to do a set, we're going to do the first half of the set is going to be all these northern english cabaret songs that, that are absolutely awful and and you've hoped that pe you hope that people in the audience will get it and they'll think this is good it's interesting it's not just the same old stuff so i think we did get an audience from that yeah and we weren't scared of losing an audience either by just changing midstream the first time we did we started using dance beats we went to america so i think probably 19 uh, i don't know 89, 90, and uh, we'd made an album, lots of dance beats on it and uh, samples and stuff. 
bear in mind the samples were like polystyrene and adamant and stuff like that but 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 they were kind of in a dance thing and we went to america and people shouted at us at gigs fucking bgs you've gone fucking disco and of course we love that we just thought brilliant this is great that's what we want you say you're not scared of losing an audience that that must be uh to me that's quite an interesting kind of statement um mm. Because if you lose all your audience completely, that's pretty much the end, isn't it? So yeah. it's very, it's a very brave thing to not being scared of that. Is uh, how much of that's real, and how much of it is kind of artistic awkwardness, and how much of it mm -hmm. could you afford? I think it. I think you're right. I think had we completely lost our audience, if they'd all just disappeared when we did an a cappella thing or the dance thing, then we probably would have had to sit down and go, shit, what are we going to do now? Because we like having an audience. It kind yeah. of keeps the whole thing going. But that never really happened because because we would do something really different and and a different set of people would like it or or some of the old people would be upset and walk away and some of them would say, oh, that's really interesting what you're trying to do there. And You were good at it. That's, that's, that's the bottom <clears throat> line, I suppose, isn't it? You know, if you'd have tried it and, <laughs> and not been good at it. That would have been different but i think the spirit certainly would be the slap album for instance the spirit mm. i think is there more prevalently than the early records um mm. which i mean i found those first two albums i think there were some good songs but i i did find it a bit po-faced as well a bit um yeah, absolutely oh sanctimonious in, in places actually to yeah. be honest uh we we, we, we did have a thing where where we realized that we were going to gigs we had this discussion after a squat gig in Sheffield. We went to this gig and there must have been like, I don't know, a couple of hundred people there. And they all sat on the floor and we did our set. And we were beforehand on the journey there, something, I can't remember what was what we were talking about, but we were taking the piss out of each other. And we were just laughing and giggling and having a really good time. And then we were, we got there late and we had to go straight on stage. We went on stage and put these kind of faces on because we were singing about nuclear war and, you know, starving babies and stuff. And then we had these faces on and then we walked off stage and then we started being silly again. And after that gig, I remember us having, having a discussion saying, this is ridiculous. That stuff that we do, that we love doing, that's fun and humorous, humorous, that's got to come into the set. That's got to come into what we do. And that's when, instead of having these serious, poor face versions of kind of theatre, we started involving theatre, which was about people dancing and getting the audience involved and, you know, and yeah, just making it joyful. That's yeah. it. I lived in a house of, uh, a shared house at the at the time of Slap. And it was, I was the only vaguely kind of punk rock type person in there really. Everybody else was, well, pretty straight upbringings really, then tempered by traveling around the world and so on, but, but still pretty straight culturally. And, and everybody really liked that album. And that's when I thought this is really working, you know? Yeah. This is stuff you can yeah. play to your friends, even if it's not kind of a narco people. Yeah. And yeah. And we, because we got a big student audience after that as well, which was strange. Okay. Right. We we're playing to those, that student circuit where you do, you know, there's, I don't know, there'd be like 800 to 1,000 people in a big student refectory. And because it was students, uh, because it was university uh, kind of booking agencies and stuff. You got really good, you know. We were used to like just turning up and there'd be like four cans of beer, unless you went went to Germany, of course. But and suddenly <laughs> we were playing these things where they were like proper backstage riders, and we were like, "Whoa, this is like, this is amazing." Tuck in, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah, it was. And and again, that audience disappeared as well, and and that was fine because we thought, right, okay, then let's move on to something else now. Then, yeah, yeah, I want to um, talk a little bit about the whole what we used to call being right on and what is now mm. well, certainly a relative of what is called woke and um yeah. the whole right on thing got really quite out of control for me in in the anarcho punk scene it became very early on i yeah. thought it just became ridiculous really um and i think it's a real shame so i think you were saying crass sort of or penny slagging off the pistols and so on that was that was almost like a sort of a seed of all this kind of stuff that that ended up being kind of, you know, policing people who, who didn't kind of, you know, fit the rules uh, of which, of course, they weren't supposed to be any. So, yeah. 
how how did you your pathway as a band mm. from the the kind of the be happy tape right yeah. the way through to um, yeah I, I had that <laughs> right the way through to uh let's say through to slap and obviously yeah. then we'll move on to the kind of when it goes mad bit um mm. you sort of followed a pathway of becoming more and more loose relaxed i think uh and more fun definitely yeah. more fun yeah and um uh, so i'm just wondering kind of how how you felt at the time about all that kind of uh, we used to call it right on yeah you know, that, that's, <laughs> yeah we, yeah we we're, them, haven't we? those people yeah because yeah. we were steeped in that we, we we went with that for a little while and it was um it was the minor strike that knocked it out of us um i was a pacifist and a vegan and and that's not a slur on pacifism or veganism it's just that sure, sure. i was looking for for a lifestyle that i could kind of you know hook onto that would kind of give me some give some meaning to what what i was doing especially having been brought up as a mormon i thought i don't want to um i don't want to just get drunk and do loads of drugs as a reaction to that, I want to kind of understand what it was about that discipline that's important, that works. That yeah, keeps don't you... throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. 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 And so it kind of felt to me like a lot of bands were half doing it, you know, going for it, but not. Whereas in my head and in, in the same with a lot of the chumbers, we were like, let's do this properly. Let's rehearse all the time and let's pool all our money and let's let's really try and do it. And that led us into that, as you said, that um, right onarchism, you know, carrying around little lists of e-numbers that had animal yeah. products in them. And you had a little list that was in my pocket. And uh, yeah, that takes me back. Sure. Eating yeah. pink wafers because the only biscuit that were that was uh, vegan and, you know, and, and just getting. Yeah. We produced a booklet called Dirty Things in Dirty Pies, which is like all the companies that were involved in everything. And, and it kind of, everything got narrower and narrower. And then the minor strike happened. And we, the, at the big, at kind of halfway through the minor strike, we, we, well, no, we'd set up a local miners support group and we got linked with a, a pit called Frickley um, in Yorkshire and raised money for them, like, Every week we were like collecting on Saturdays outside supermarkets and all that. And then we and we teamed up with the local SWP. Much to, you know, we were scared stiff of it because but we had a van. We had a van that could fit like 15 people in it. They didn't have a van, but they had organization. And they were absolutely lovely people, the people that were in our particular bit of the SWP. And and we we kind of had an agreement right at the beginning, said, Well, look, we in order, you know, for the mining strike, we need to do this, but let's not try and kind of sell each other's politics to each other all the time because it'll just get boring. Let's just kind of enjoy it. And we did. We really enjoyed it. And we were, we did it for, you know, six months or so. And we went down to Freakly Pit. And um, one one of the times that we went, we stay, we'd stay overnight with the, the in the families, miners' families, and they'd put us up. And you, we get there thinking, right, this is about getting up at 4 a.m. to go on the picket line and confront scabs and police. And it's deadly serious. And, you know, and we're all vegans and all that sort of thing. And um, and they took us out to the miners' welfare in Frickley. And it was packed. There were like 150 people in there. And, you know, the beer was you know, like 20p a pint. Kind of thing. I didn't drink then. But it was... And they had a you missed it out. <laughs> I know. And they had a comedian and they had, you know, cabaret singers and it was kind of everything that we weren't really supposed to be into, but it was, it was just glorious. And it was, I, and I remember thinking this, this is, this is, these are our people. These are real people. And these are, you know, if you're from a Lancashire mill town that you think, well, this, this is real life, not that kind of anarcho thing of, of trying to be holier than thou and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And it just had a really big effect on us. We were talking about it for weeks afterwards. Like, it's brilliant that you, you just, they're, they're suffering so much. They're under the caution. They're getting slagged off in the media all the time. They still go out and have a really good time. And, you know, and the, the comedian's telling 
you know, off color jokes. And you just think it's fucking brilliant. This let's stop being so trying to be so perfect. And then later that year, we did uh, at the end of the year, we did a tour with Flux of Pink Indians and um, uh, Kirk K U K L with Bjork in them and yeah, and DMV. And it was a minus thing. And by that time, we were all just having a laugh on this bus and having a really good time. And we, we'd get to the gigs and there'd be people like uh, object and our anarchists outside, green anarchists who were objecting to the uh, how coal mining was bad for the environment and we shouldn't be supporting the miners because of that. And, mm-hmm. the, and, yeah. I, and there were people in the audience said, um, the miners, uh, you know, they're all, they're all uh, meat-eating sexist. You know, why are you doing a, a benefit for them? And... I just remember by that time, by that Christmas of 84, 85, we were like, right, we've had enough of that. Can't can't be doing with that. Let's let's get out of it and and like and stop all this kind of yeah. You talk like, about this in a very positive way and you highlight the positives of uh, you know, we we our eyes were open sort of thing, but it must have also been a bit quite difficult because your your own personal uh, way of living was kind of being challenged, wasn't it? Yeah. So that must have been quite a, an uncomfortable feeling. I would think. Yeah, but it, but it, I think it was really liberating. I remember when I was a vegan, I, I, I made a homemade shirt that said, um, whatever it is, you know, f- f- twenty three million uh, turkeys will die for your Christmas dinner this year, and I wore it to to my family, my mum and dad's house Christmas day. And there are four. Went down well. <laughs> and, yeah. And now I think, what a what a knobhead. <laughs> what a self-righteous knobhead. Uh, we you all know. were though. You know. I know, but it's horrible, isn't it? Mm. And and so realizing that was really good. It was like, right. Oh, yeah. And we went to Europe really early, you know, probably about 86 or something. And and with the X, I think, and did did some gigs there. And they were the X fantastic band and beautiful people. Uh, not vegetarians, a couple of them might have been. And everywhere we went, people were putting us up and making us big meals. And for the first bit of it, some some of us were like, oh, no, I can't eat that. I can, you know, it's got cheese in it. I'm sorry, you know, and going out and eating crisps instead on from motorway services. And by the end of that tour, I think we were all like, oh, fuck it. This, these people are brilliant and they're making us these meals. Who are we to start, you know, judging them up, making them feel weird about it? And that was all that stuff was all a process. And I'm sure, obviously, you'll you'll remember all that. There were ways out of it. And, you know, you kind of think, okay, phew. The other thing is, there was this thing in, in probably in the 87, 88, before, round about Slap, there was, um, were they called Brew Crew? Yeah, kind of yeah. came out of the, the, the travellers scene. Yeah. Many of them were brilliant, but then this whole... Sub- subculture came up which was basically hard drugs and fighting and so whenever we played uh down south in play especially in places you know like you know wiltshire and places like that you just get all these people turn up these awful people they wouldn't pay they just walk straight in and and start fighting with someone who was trying to take money on the door even if it's a benefit and then they did have fights inside and then they'd be like hey fucking love your band and we were like, no, that's we don't want that audience. Yeah, we, we we we've got to actively get away from that. And that's when mm-hmm. we went to uh, we went to Southern Records. That was a kind of a way of, of trying to move away from all that sort of thing. <clears throat> Ironically, actually, I suppose, given that Southern was yeah. very connected with Crass and so on. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, um, on one level at least. Um. I'm quite interested in the fact that you said you all shared money and all that sort of thing when you squatted. Because mm. mm. I tried all that and mm-hmm. our experiment was a disaster. Right. None of us were old enough to be responsible enough. And mm. and it was it all just got a bit Lord of the Flies in the end in, in our particular circumstances, <laughs> really. How old were you when you were trying to do that? I was I was twenty. I was right. a very young twenty. I was very, uh, I was yeah. very immature twenty. Personally, most people were younger than that, and one or two people were older, but only by a year or two, something like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, because we'd have we'd have all been you, uh, yeah, kind of yeah, twenty two, twenty three, when we started doing that. Do you and, think that's a big? Obviously, when you're younger, two or three years is a long time, isn't it? Do you think that's? Do you, do you think that would account for the fact you seem to have made it work? No, I think no, I, I, no, because Harry and me were really young, so I think it was just. Uh, it was just a lovely time for us to be trying to do something together and we all really trusted each other. And some of it probably was probably quite austere in terms of, you know, nobody felt like they would just dip their hand into the collective pot and just go out and get completely pissed. And then say, Oh, I'm sorry, everyone. I just spent 20 quid down the pub. Hey, I'm interested happened. in that. How, how come nobody did that? Because we had this vision of what we wanted to do, and we were, we were, we, and we loved it, and and it was enjoyable to do, and and that would have fucked it up. So you all held it together for the bigger, the bigger vision, so to speak. Yeah, and we kind of understood as well that that um, you know, in terms of anarchist politics, we didn't believe that everyone is 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 equal on every level and that you all have to do the same things. And, you know, when we first started, uh, we had a band in between Chimpix Banana and Chumbawamba called uh, The Three Duncans, and um, which was a kind of parody of The Three Johns. And uh, we decided that we would all change instruments every song. And we carried that on into the very, very early Chumbawamba. It was like, Right, Alice, you're playing bass on this one. And then, oh, Alice, you're drums on this next one. And between every song, we'd all swap instruments because we thought that was egalitarian. And it was just stupid. It didn't work. It was ridiculous. <laughs> this is brilliant, brilliant in its absurdity. <laughs> yeah. And we, you know, and we learned. We thought, okay, that doesn't work. Let's let's do the things that we know we can that we can do that we're good at. And and we all seem so well balanced. This is what's do you, know what, to do you know another thing I think, and I've always I've always thought this is that the fact that, that there were dominant women in the band made such a difference because we kept playing with and meeting and, and going on tour with bands that were almost usually all blokes, often mm. with like one woman, and the balance wasn't right. And and you could see it. And and we constantly had that balance because you know. We had Lou and Alice and Kobe at first, and they were they were just powerful women, and they liked to laugh as much as as everybody else. But but they wouldn't be they wouldn't be putting up with, you know, lads acting like lads and being idiots. It was like no, this if we're gonna make this work, let's 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 take it seriously. Still have a laugh with it, but so did you have no inner idiot or? Or did you just keep it under control? I mean, I'm I'm quite sort of astounded, in, in, a, in a good way, by by how the, how the lack of inner idiot. Well, yeah, I mean, I've got a massive inner idiot, and I think most yeah. people have, you know. Yeah. Where's yours? Um, I think some people in the band did have an inner, inner idiot, and I think that. So I think, for instance, later on, I think when when uh, kind of party drugs came along. I think that kind of revealed inner idiots in 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 most of us, and we had to learn how to how to deal with it. Um, another thing is that because of, because of, I came from a a background where my dad had been had, had been punching my mum when when he was drunk, and one of my earliest memories is and me and my sister talk about this is that we were in we used to live at my grandma's house. We were in bed with my grandma and my mum and me and my sister, and my granddad was downstairs trying to stop my dad getting in the house and my dad was outside the house going, let me in, let me in, you know, totally pissed. And my granddad was downstairs stopping him. So I thought I'm not going to drink. I'm, I'm his kid. I'm that's, that's what I'm going to be like. So I didn't drink until I had a thing in, 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 I think it was 1990. I said, me and Dunce used to go on the football all the time. And I said, if Burnley win the fourth division championship this year, I'm going to get drunk. <laughs> and they won. They won the championship, you know, eight months later or whatever. So I, I just went out and got drunk, and I just thought, it's an experiment, I'll see. And I just thought, oh, my goodness, I've discovered that I'm a really happy drunk, and, I'm, and I just love it, and I'm, I'm just silly, and I don't want to pick fights with anyone. 
and it was great. It was like great. Okay, I, I can do that now. Mm. Well, I think that really helped me not drinking till I was till 1990 because that was the time when it was like, look, let's get this band together. I was driving the van in Holland on tour when Alice and Harry, I think, were spewing up out the windows as we drove along the motorway. It was that, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and I was aware that, you know, because I remember getting to the ex's house once after coming on the ferry and looking at the side of the van and going, why is the pew called down the side of the van? <laughs> and and I think that stood us in good stead, you know, that thing of, yeah, let, let's be silly, but, you know, we want to make this work. Absolutely. How long have we got in Stanley Buff? Because uh... um, a quarter of an hour? Quarter of an hour. That's that's good for right. me. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. I'm, I'm thinking then, rather than rushing through everything, mm. we haven't even got to you being famous yet. So <laughs> I think I'll just kind of keep keep going along these lines. Okay. Um. So yeah, okay. So you've got the band. You've done slap. Uh, slap to me is so absolutely brilliant record, really. Great. Um, oh, I, yeah, because I like that one. I think it's, yeah. I think the energy of it's lovely. Yeah. 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 And then, I guess we're gonna approach you uh getting to the point where you signed to emi mm. um which i i honestly think is probably the most interesting thing that any of the anarcho punk bands did in a positive way really because mm. um because obviously yeah they hadn't they they weren't still in bed with thorn and that was always the point yeah. which which so many people seem to miss really yeah exactly. um I'll probably leave it to a part two if you're amenable to actually talk about the whole the whole yeah. time something take yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but in terms of the kind of run up to that, um I had a a discussion, should we say, recently about major labels and independent labels, and there seems particularly in America to be this um adherence in what you might call the DIY scene to think all things DIY are good and yeah. all things major label are bad and yeah. when I went to work at Sounds as a music journalist I discovered that this was a complete myth yeah. and you know the, the people in major labels were every bit as nice as and often quite nicer yeah. than people in independence so yeah. what I'm wondering uh, having got that off my chest what I'm wondering yeah. is the process where you sort of thought okay let's kind of go for it with emi or, or a major label or let's just do something that different basically yeah it was it was a we knew it was a huge thing and because before that we'd we'd been doing the student circuit and we'd been playing with credit to the nation and we were getting played on the radio anyway and all that sort of thing and we were with uh southern uh, sorry, with One Little Indian, uh, which was Derek Burkett, of course, from Flux. And he, he's, you know, he's a lovely bloke. He's brilliant. But um, they were having label problems because they wanted to sell the they wanted to sell the American version of their label as one big package to America to some big distributor for like a, a million dollars or something, which which then was like a astronomical. And, and we were kind of on there. It was like Bjork and the Shearmen and some others I can't remember and we were part of that thing we didn't really know all this at the time we found out as we went along so they were wanting to do all this, at this but they were holding holding back what we wanted to put out and we, we were saying well we we recorded some demos and we, we want to record it properly and and they were going well what we'd like you to do is would you agree to meeting up with some producers who could maybe do something with one of your songs and maybe you know put some fairy dust on it and we was we were like no we you know we always we do our own thing that's that's what it is plus we don't play demos to record labels uh that's something we learnt off the fall it was like no you never play your demos to a record label because they'll say oh no my you know my daughter says that the the i at sound should be louder on that <laughs> yeah, right. okay so yeah. we had a policy and but this dragged on and on it went on for about six months and we were like look we've no money uh, everyone in the band has got part-time jobs. We've we've no, more or less finished this album. What's what's happening? And they said, "Well, can we hear a demo of the the you know the songs?" We sent we sent them a cassette or whatever it was, a DAT tape of about four songs. And the first song was Tub Thumping, 
and Derek wrote back, um, and I, I love Derek. He wrote this back saying, "Really sorry to say this, guys, but uh, I don't think there's any, uh, there's nothing on here that I can see. You know, we really, we really want to." if we're going to take this further and we have to work with outside producers, because there's nothing on here that's, that's going to work. Yep. So we, so we basically yeah, yeah. said, well, we, you know, we've never signed a contract with you, so we, we're going to walk away. And they were like, okay, that's fine. Cause we were just kind of bugging them at this point. I think they were just like a, a fly on the shoulder. Yeah. So we walked away from one little Indian and, and it left us with a sour taste about the music industry anyway, because we just thought it's all, it's all this chicanery of of business deals and handshakes that we weren't privy to, and yet we were suffering for it. And we were just, you know, look, Jude was packing uh, shirts into cellophane wrappers at Burton's in Leeds, you know, so that we could carry on doing the album. It was that it was that real, and we just thought, you know, fuck that scene, that indie thing. It's just it's just the same as the other lot. And then. Uh, the tape we played the tape to Doug, who was our kind of well, he wasn't our manager then, but we had to take him on because it all got too big. But he was he used to be a Hopewind and Motorhead yeah. manager. Doug Smith. Yeah. yeah. And uh what a character. Him and Eve. And Eve still does loads of stuff with us. She's fantastic. But uh Doug um he got the tape and he played it to a few people and they immediately came back and said, Right, I've got to get this to the on the desk of such and such a person and such and such a person, this song. And it, it re- literally was about four to six weeks of this madness going on where people suddenly realised this song could work and could be could get in the charts. And, of course, we were just like, yeah, whatever. But we had no record label because one li- we, we walked away from One Little Indian. They didn't want it. So so it ended up at EMI in Germany, not not England EMI. They, they, had, they didn't want to have anything to do with us. Uh, Germany EMI were just brilliant. And they said, because we played in Germany all the time at that point, we were always gigging in Germany. So we went to see them and they were just brilliant people. And and we said, right, we want this and this and this and this. An absolute artistic control over this and this and this. We produce everything ourselves. We do all the artwork ourselves. There's no censorship of lyrics. Um, yeah, you give us all this money. We can do whatever we want with it. There's no strings attached. We're not going to record in your studios. We're not going to, Use your, you know, all the all the usual ways they claw the money back, and they went, okay, yeah, great. And we signed with them, and when we when we came out of that deal, which was I don't know, like a couple of years later, uh, nothing. I, I've got nothing but praise for the people that worked for us in Germany. They were fantastic, and so I think this. I I agree. I think that I think the mythology of indies versus majors is is ridiculous. I know there are some ridiculously awful majors and terrible cutthroat, you know, corporation going on. But it's for us, it was great because we just kept control of it all yeah. and enjoyed it. And you did it remarkably well. That seems like a great EastEnders Duff Duff moment to me, where okay, <laughs> where <laughs> and, and to be continued in part two, we talk about yeah. you getting famous. Well, the the yeah. song getting famous certainly. Um, yeah. And we can kind of go into all the intricacies of that because I yeah. think that's um, yeah. Because I think that because yeah. as a, talking to you as opposed to talking to just someone from you know a, a music magazine or whatever is that I know I know that I can put that that tub thumping era I can put it in context of what had come before and why we were able to so easily kind of deal with it and enjoy it and you know not get burnt out and. And it was all to do with, yeah, learning. Yeah. Through the 1980s and early 90s. Yeah, absolutely. Which I think you did quite um, in, in a quite an unprecedented way, actually, truthfully. Yeah. Before and we never, that, you'd always had, even, even the clash, you know, sort of, uh, I mean, I was probably making far too many demands on them in my teenage idealistic head. Yeah. But yeah. the way they sort of all just went off to America and started doing songs that went J A Z Z, even yeah. though they're from yeah. London and stuff like this. Yeah, yeah, and, and you, yeah. You avoided all that, and I was I was incredibly yeah. impressed by it. Once yeah. I found out, that's another story. I, I didn't even I wasn't even aware that you were doing all this at the time. But right. but that's for next time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> let's 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 carry on later then. Excellent.
listen Brilliant. thank you so much for your time i'm going to stop the recording now and then i'm just okay. going to thank you off camera so to speak okay and uh and to be continued but thanks so much for your time both yeah thank you yeah so you, i'll just i'll yeah see yeah. you later <laughs>